Today we're going to talk about wholeness of the cross. And they call me Pastor Drew, and I want to say welcome to you if you're a first-time visitor. Um, we're, uh, I'm Pastor Drew. I'm a pastor over the, the uh, what is it, outreach. That's what I am over, <laughs> outreach. We're outreach and all this thing, over outreach. And I um, and, uh, just want to say you online, too, that um, thank you for sharing and, and, and viewing, and hopefully uh, the Lord will bless you today. We're going to talk about wholeness through the cross. Hallelujah. The cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Good girl. Pray to the church. You know, I had that thing right in front of me, and I still didn't do it. Okay, we're going to pray for the church. We're going to pray for um, the Skyline Baptist Church for um, Pastor Ted and Brenda and their community, and I believe it's this way. So let's just point this way, and we'll pray for this church. Uh, one thing about our church, we pray for a church once Every week we pray for one church and we pray through it throughout the week. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we just say thank you, Lord, for this Baptist church, God. We thank you for this church, Father, God. We thank you for Brenda and Todd, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are blessing them even today, Father. We pray that souls will get saved. We pray that you'll set them on fire, that there will be a burning church too, God, that they'll be on fire, that you'll send revival, you'll bring converts, that you would raise them up, Father. You would bless them financially, Lord. You would open up doors that no man could shut. Just bless them. We pray blessing upon them in Jesus' Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I, I do the calling to the church. I said, you see, it's a, 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 um, a message. But one lady answered and she said, you're praying for our church. And I said, yes. She goes, that is so cool. You guys are praying. I said, yeah, it's okay. About 10 minutes later, the pastor called me and said, you are praying for our church? I said, yeah, we're praying for it. He goes, man, I got to meet you. Let's have breakfast. So I had breakfast with them at IHOP the next week. So it was good, man. And, uh, just, and they were just totally um, fascinated that people would just pray for other churches. And, and because we are concerned about the body of Christ. Come on. There's too many divisions, and I know that um, uh, even uh, this uh, Jesus tent that's coming up, we had a meeting of different pastors and stuff, and, and we're trying to um, uh, uh, do a philosophy of Salem. It's the um, Christian community has the most unity of any other community in the state of Oregon. How's that? Amen. Come on. God, do it. And they're, they're already sitting on fire, and, and, and people are being added each time, and we're going to be doing more things and reaching out and helping with um, the Jesus tent, and not only that, other things that other people are doing. Because too many, too, too, far too long that we've been separated as churches and things, you know. Got to be together. Okay, this is the first slide, the wholeness through the cross. The cross. How many say, thank you, Jesus, for the cross of Jesus Christ, man, the sacrifice that he did? You know, um, one thing about um, sometimes us, even, even us and just us people, because we're so full of faith and we believe in God and we trust in God and we believe in great things, sometimes all we think about is things that are just positive. You don't want to hear no negative, like, uh, I, my knee isn't healed, I believe God is healed. No, I, hey, it needs healing. I'm going to a sports doctor. I thank God that it ain't as bad as it was. But guess what? That's a reality. Sometimes you just got to face reality. God can heal it. You better believe it. I might get healed before I leave this pulpit tonight, today. I might jump off the pew and do four somersaults. <laughs> not really, bro. A long time ago, maybe. Not now. I remember one time I was preaching at a church. And uh, it, we were borrowing a church because we were uh, building in a, uh, our church in North Portland. We went to this um, uh, Seven Day Adventist church, and they had these pews, and they had the um, where you kneel on, on the thing, the kneel, and it had like bars were up about that high. And I was preaching, and I um, was doing an object lesson. And I dove over the thing, did a flip on the ground, landed on my feet, and I was like, "You're crazy, <laughs> rugged maniac." So <laughs> I said, I'm not doing that no more. Then one time I jumped off the stage. I was like jumping off and I had dress shoes and I slid like I was on skis. I was like, I am not doing that no more. I'm going to get hurt, man. Better calm down. My wife, ever since we've been married and we'll be celebrating 14 years in September, has ever since she's, we've been married, she's been saying, slow down, slow the mo, pump the brake. I said, I'm trying, I'm trying. Hallelujah. But the cross is the most famous emblem of all times, isn't it? 
Hollywood loves the cross. I've seen one guy um, on TV that I think there was a war thing. He had a cross about this big, silver all blinging and everything else. And you got people with cross tatted on their neck. You got, I have a friend that he, he got saved and he, 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 he had a, uh, a cross tatted on his back. And, it was, and this guy's big. He's like six foot five. And his whole back is a cross. And he said that the guy that, tat, that did the work on him, said he was feeling sorry for him because that must have hurt. But the cross, so many different ways we, we express the cross. And I will say about the negative part, here's the thing is this. One thing about God's word, there is some parts that are not positive, like that, that seem pretty negative. Uh, if somebody spends their eternity in hell, that's very negative in my opinion. Is it right? If somebody goes to heaven, that's very positive in my opinion. But without knowing both of the things, you just can't just say everybody's going to heaven and everything's fine. Because if it was, Jesus would have never, ever, ever, ever even thought about dying on that cross if everybody was going to heaven. If there was some way we could get to heaven by our own works, Jesus would have never died on the cross. The Bible says, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. Jesus knew that there's no other way that we could get to heaven but through the cross. And we're talking about wholeness. We're starting a series on wholeness. We're going to have several speakers. It's probably last five, six weeks and could be seven or eight weeks. I don't know, but at least six weeks. It'll be um, on wholeness and different aspects. But first of all, we're going to talk about the cross because to get true wholeness, you have to go through the cross. Well, I'm not talking about therapy, man. I'm not talking about just some things that'll tickle your, get tickles on your arms and like, I got the willies, so I felt the Holy Ghost. I, I have people tell me that while they're drunk. I, I, I got the willies. I'm like, don't tell me that's the Holy Ghost, bro. It's not about feelings, it's about faith, it's about trusting in God. And here's the deal is this, like a battery, if you take the positive off the battery and just the negative, it will not run. You take the, the, the negative off and just have positive, it will not run. You need a balance of positive and negative. It's true. You got it, man. That's the only way it's going to work. We got to know, know the truth. The truth shall make you free. We need the truth. All, nothing but the truth. So help me God. I used to love when I do um, the um, jury duty. In the old days, you could, you know, swear on the Bible. Now they don't even let you swear on the Bible no more. I'm like, where's the Bible at? So, yeah, they don't say, hey, put the hand on the Bible and swear you'll do it. They said, you promise you'll do it? Like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. I'm like, I'll give you my word. I just lied to that guy yesterday, but I'll give you my word. It's not, it's not the way it, it was before. But that's still, it's, still, uh, it's still a positive um, process. I, I believe in it. And I believe God is in it, too, on helping, on bringing righteousness to our country. Because righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. So that's what we're praying about. But the cross is that emblem. I even wore my, um, I have a cross on right here. Little black cross. And there's a little teeny diamond in there. You probably can't see it. I can't even see it with my eyes right now. It's really small. My daughter says, Dad, that diamond is real. She gave it to me. I said, oh, that's so nice. But the cross, what a way for, for Jesus to come through. The cross is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. Crucifixion is mentioned 37 times in, um, in the Bible. It's an instrument of capital, of, capital, um, of capital punishment, of death. Jesus chose that way. That's why the Bible says that, that to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. The cross. It's like, they're like, I just can't grasp upon that. You mean my Messiah, who's going to come and save the world, who's going to do a great work and re uh, take over the kingdoms and be the king of the earth, is going to come in a manger, born of a virgin, live a holy life, and then be persecuted and killed and shed blood for us. It just don't work. It's a stumbling block to them. 
Do you know that while Jesus was here, they tried to say, that, they were said that, that can't be our Messiah because he wasn't born in Bethlehem. Nowhere in the scripture shows them that he was born there. They're proving through the scriptures that it wasn't him. They could not get over the thought that Jesus came as a man in flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I like one translation that says he hanged out with us. Aren't you glad that he hangs out with us? Yeah. Hallelujah. But it was a punishment. It was the blood, the blood of Jesus. They just could not understand that. They mocked him to the very end. Even while he was on the cross, he said, you saved others, save yourself. I think about, you know, and oh, I was going to recommend this book too. This book is called The Cross. Can you see all that? That's pretty good red letters there. But it's by Charles Spurgeon. It's a 40-day, 10-minute devotion on the cross. Just the last minutes of the cross, the word that Jesus spoke, the acts that he did. And it is powerful. It will touch your heart. Because you know how we, every, every once a month we get our communion, we think about it. I know I seriously, when I take communion, I think about the sacrifice that Jesus made. I think about the blood that he shed for us. And I, I really do think about it. But this brother here is from an 1800s uh, pastor. They called him the Prince of Preachers. He, he, he just breaks it down in simplicity and shows you different aspects where your heart gets broken of the sacrifice and your heart gets healed because of the things that God did for us so that we can be whole you know Jesus wasn't forced to the cross you better like the Roman soldiers made him no the Bible says three times Jesus said no man takes my life but I lay it down you ain't big enough to take Jesus down nobody is but he laid it down knowing that without that sacrifice without the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ we would all be without hope and desperate Hallelujah. And then to the Jews it says that it was a stumbling block to the, um, to the Jews, but to the Greeks it was foolishness. Because the Greeks are all about wisdom. Like it's being so wise. You know, sometimes you can be so wise that you miss God. The Bible says by the foolishness of preaching, God chose to save people. Because the, the, the Greeks, they're like, it's philosophically unsound, the idea of a man coming and going through all that and being a king of kings and a lord of lords. So they thought it was foolishness. Paul said this, he said, he goes, when I preach to people, I didn't preach with eloquencies of word. I didn't preach with good language. And, you know, I was like, good, at least me and him are in the same boat. He said, but I, I didn't want people to rely on how well I preached or how well I spoke. But what I want them to rely on, the power of the cross. What the cross could do for them. How the cross can totally change your life. How the cross can make a way where there is no way. How the cross can transform your life and make it brand new. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The cross. They couldn't figure it out. That's like, man, this is so much. And, and God said, the Bible says he chose the foolishness of this world. God in his weakness is stronger than anybody on this earth. God in his Weakness and wisdom is way brighter than others. You know, some people are like, man, I just, I don't know if I believe in that cross stuff because, you know, I want to be open-minded. Well, sometimes you can be so open-minded, your brains fall out. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't think it. Come on. God wants us to be open-hearted, not open-minded. You know, some people do actually miss heaven by nine inches. I said, bro, Drew, how you miss heaven by nine inches? From the brain to the heart's about nine inches. They put it in the brain. They try to filter it out, try to figure it out, which the Jews was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it was foolishness. And they come up with a place where, ah, oh, I'm not going to believe that because I just don't, can't figure it out and I don't want to. And I'm not, my mind will not let me. Instead of saying, like a child, the Bible says, except you be converted, become like a little child, you cannot enter in the kingdom of God. Children believe their moms and dads. 
That, it's, that's why it's important. He got three prophets over here. They're going to be believing him when he says, I prophesy over you. They believe. They don't, like when I told my kid, that, that, that is something that is going to hurt you. You know what they say? They say, my dad said it, so I believe it. That's how we receive the word of God. With simplicity like a child. The cross. Hallelujah. The next slide. Yes, okay. And so Paul, Paul was like really all into the cross because he realized all the religion that he had. And he, he is way more religious than any of us. And you know what I was thinking today too? You know, sometimes we're so against religion that it becomes a dirty word even to Christians. Isn't that sad? I remember like when I, I go um, visit the... Um, McLaren's, I go visit the prisoners, young men, and they say, uh, religious volunteers here to visit, you know, the certain uh, cottage. And I was like, eh, I'm offended. I'm not a religious volunteer. I have Jesus Christ in me. I'm born again. I have the power of God in me. I bowed myself to the cross. But I was like, okay, I'll go in. <laughs> That's what they call you. It's all right to be religious, but it's, it's bad to use just religion to be your means to get to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father but by me. Because he's the only one who went on the cross. He's the only one who died and was in the grave for three days and was buried and, and rose again on the third day. Only one. That's what makes our, our religion, it is a religion, you know, it's not a bad word. Don't be hating on that word. It's okay if you're religious, if you got the right religion. If you got Jesus Christ in your heart, ain't nothing wrong with that. It's good. It's good. Well, Paul, he was like, he was just so about the cross. He said, he said this. He said, if I go to other places, I don't want to know nothing about their religion, their church. And all I want to know about is Christ and him crucified. Then we got something in common ground. And I think that's what's really cool about us pastors getting together in the city of Salem. It's like we, there's so many different religions. You baptize this way, you sprinkle, you dunk. You know, some people dunk for like five seconds hoping that the demon will come out. But it doesn't matter. We're all focusing on the cross of Jesus Christ. Because the cross is where we get our liberty. It's the cross where we get set free. It's the blood of Jesus. You know, when you talk about the cross, you're going to be talking about several things. And here's what Paul said, because like people are trying to put glory to Paul, bring glory to him. And he said, God forbid that I should boast except in one thing. What? The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by the whole, by the whole world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God forbid. He's like, that's the strongest, strongest statement that he could say. It's like, there ain't no way I want a glory. And we need to be that way ourselves. You do something good, something great, you don't need to wait for somebody to sign your autograph or make a new business card or get your pat on the back. How about let's just point our finger up and say, thank you, Lord, for the cross. Yes. Amen. Whoa. It's not about us. He said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross. Matter of fact, he said this in Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. That's pretty heavy. It's a sacrifice. When you think about the cross, you think about sacrifice. You think about love. You think about blood. You think about um, God's mercy and forgiveness and wholeness. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He took it personal. I don't care if your grandma was saved. You need to let them live in you. Amen? It's a personal relationship. Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That's taking a mighty personal. When Jesus was on the cross, you say, how could he do it? Well, he's God. He could do it. Your, your, your name was in his mind. 
Your face was in his mind while he was on the cross. While he suffered for six grueling hours on the cross, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He was thinking, man, bro, you can't make it without me. I better do this. I got to go through it. He thirsted. He suffered. He seen people mocking him. But he said, no, I got you, you, you in my mind. And I want you to have eternal life and to be free and to have a purpose and a destiny in life. And then after this world's done, have eternity and live with him forever and ever. How's that sound? Come on. Woo! Sorry, I get a little excited. You know, my knee's feeling better already. I'm almost ready to jump. I'm almost ready. Hallelujah. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Okay, in Colossians it says this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All the religious ways, all the acts, all the different things that we try to do to get that peace with God. It's like that burning, the burning man, they're, gonna, they're all trying to get peace. They're trying to do it this way and do that way. You get a certain little bit of peace, but there's only one true author of peace. It's called the Prince of Peace. And he was on the cross and he died for us. And the thing was is that he nailed to the cross the things that were holding us against him, the things that were holding us back. And one thing that was holding us back, even our just our nationality. Just be, you know what a Gentile is? Everybody know what a Gentile is? Anybody in here are 100% Jewish? Okay, y'all Gentiles. We're Gentiles. Gentiles means non-Jewish. Before we didn't, we had little tints of, uh, of hope, but basically nothing. Jesus, when he came, he tore down that wall of the separation, the partition that was held before us, nailed it to the cross. And the Bible says he having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public show of them openly, triumphant of it. The world looked at Jesus on the cross and thought it was shameful in a bad place. The enemy didn't even really understand. He thought he was winning for a while. But really what Jesus was doing is openly... On the cross, defeating the enemy and tearing away all his power and his authority and anything that he had against us was totally removed by the cross. Yeah, you, Hallelujah. The Bible says, for this reason was the Son of Man manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I like that. He didn't say break, because when you break, you put some super glue on it, it'll be back. He said, no, I'm going to destroy the works of the devil. He's going to totally lay it out. And he, the Bible says, spoiled, having spoiled, having tore down, he made a show of them openly. And then we find, and this is in Romans 5, 11, talk about atonement. And it says, not only so, but we also joy in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. Atonement is, is, is talked about in the... Um, Old Testament, 81 times, because every time they did a sacrifice, they were doing it to get atoned. And atoned means really to be reconciled or to bring peace back, to forgive your sins and to bring peace back with God. But it didn't work. That's why I was mentioned all the time. Even the priest at the end of the year had to do his own sacrifice for him because he could not get to that place. Atonement is only mentioned one time in the New Testament, and that's here in Romans 5, 11. It talks about atonement. We receive atonement. And one, I like this um, new translation. Anybody heard, heard of the ERV translation? It's called easy reading version. I like that. It's pretty cool. It's easy to read. But what they said for atonement is, is that you're now, instead of just being atoned or reconciled, where it's reconciled, some people might not even know what that means. It means when you're at enemy, you become friends again. But, but to be atoned in the ERV version, it means to be, now be God's friend. We sang it today. We're now God's friend. We have a friend. That sticks closer than a brother. We're no longer just slaves and people that are um, uh, just serving God. But we are actually Christ's friend. Yes. Hallelujah. And it's through the cross and through the atonement. The, the blood. And here's what I love about the blood. 
Think about it. You know, the Passover. We all know the Passover, right? It's when um, the final plague of the, uh, when Moses was doing all the plagues, trying to get the people free from Egypt. The final plague was the firstborn was going to die. And, he, and um, in order to um, distinguish between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, he said to take hyssop and blood and mark the, the side of your door, the top of your door, and the side of your door. Not the threshold because you don't want to walk on the blood, but mark it. And then when the angel of death came, it went by that house and it seen the blood. When it seen the blood on the post, it passed over. That's why they call it the, the Passover. And, and it passed over. It didn't matter what he did that night. didn't matter if the family was arguing. didn't matter if they sinned before. When, when, when the angel of death seen the blood, that was good enough. When God sees the blood on our heart, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God sees the blood. The enemy, the enemy will remind us about yesterday. I like how you were talking, Sister Cheryl, my wife, honey. She calls me Andrew. No, she don't. She calls me like, you do that. No. Uh, yeah, but no, she does. She calls me sweetheart, too, sometimes. <laughs> but when the blood, when God sees the blood, he passes over Paul even talks about in the New Testament that Christ is our Passover. And we're going to go into a scripture that's going to talk about some of that, the atonement. But God gives us atonement through the cross, the sacrifice of the cross. And we, we become friends of God and we're reconciled. Actually, the Bible says this, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and everything becomes new. Everything. Anybody been there? New creature in Christ Jesus? Is that awesome or what? That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. But in the verse um, 18, it says this, And God, who's called us, has given us a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. God wants us to bring people to God. God wants us to, to make it right with people, to help people to get atoned to God by bringing the message of the cross. Because through the cross, there's activity to Jesus. It's not by works. The Bible says, by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man boast. I know, how many like gifts? What's the, one of the best things about a gift? It's free. Right? I know, I know, like, I have six kids. They're not kids no more. They're my grandkid, he came and did the rugged maniac. He's 22 years old. He beat us all out. But um, um, I have six kids, and on Christmas, one thing we did is we made sure they had a lot of presents. We just had the tree all full of presents and everything else. And when they came down, I'd, I'd get up really early, put them underneath the tree, and I, they'd come down, and they'd be like, uh, uh, I'd have them all sit down, and I'd get ready to open the presents. When they opened the presents, they just run to that present. They didn't care what it was wrapped like. They didn't care about the bowl. They'd just tear that thing up and just and get their present and say, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Mom. They didn't even think about, they could have pulled out their wallet and said, how much you pay for this gift? They didn't. It's a gift. The thing about Jesus and the wholeness that Christ has for us, it's not by what we do. It's by who we know. It's not by where we go, it's by, it's by who do we go through. And it's a total gift. Yeah. Hallelujah, it's a free gift. Wholeness and freedom through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a, this is a, um, a quote from Charles Spurgeon. Not out of this book, but I've read it out of a different book. But it says, your love held back the axe when justice said, cut it down. It's talking about that parable in, in, um, in Luke 13 where it talks about how somebody came to get the fruit tree and it wasn't there. He went back for three years, it wasn't there. And he was like, hey, I'm, I'm, let's, cut up, let's cut it down. Let's just, why, why take up the space of the ground? And the, and, and the, the, uh, the servant said, 
says, please give me one more chance. I'll fertilize it. I'll fix it and come back in a year. If it's not good, go ahead and cut it down. And, um, but he says, okay, I'll give you one year. But that's like God. God's always, always giving us another chance and giving us opportunity and, and avenues and doors and ways to help us to just go for it because God loves us. His love really I always like when I talk to the people at the prisons a lot of time, I was like, look, God ain't, God ain't mad at you because if he was, he'd be mad at all of us and we'd all be a, 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 a spark of dust right now. Lightning would be all over the joint because of the things that we've done. We'd be a puff of ashes, but God loves you and he wants you to make it. He wants to have, give you a future. He wants to bless you. And so... He, because of the love, held back the axe. He, we deserve judgment, don't we? Some people are like, I don't deserve judgment. I never sinned. Yes, you have. All have sinned and come short to the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Hallelujah. And, and I like this, this scripture in Ephesians, the next one, slide. It says, therefore, remember... Sometimes we just got to remember where we came from. I know you've been saved for 10, 15 years, 20 years, some for only months. Might have been saved for a short time. And you forget where you came from. But sometimes it's good to remember where we came from. And that's why Paul told the Ephesians, he says, Remember formerly that you were Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcision by them who called themselves circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Then he says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners of the covenant of the promise without hope, without God in the world. What a sad scenario for all of us if it wasn't the cross, isn't it? It's sad where we would be if we didn't have the cross. But God brought the cross so that we can have hope. And the Bible says he abolished the places that the, the things that were holding us back. And he set it down and he opened the door wide open for us. Yeah. Hallelujah. So it's important to remember. I think about when um, Nathan, um, David wanted to build the house of God. And Nathan said, um, he asked Nathan, his prophet, he says, can I build the house of, house of, house of God? And Nathan said, do whatever's on your heart. It's totally cool, bro. Something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so that night, God spoke to Nathan and says, no, I'm not going to have him build a house. I've not dwelled in tents. I've not built in, had nobody build a house yet. And it's not for him because his hands had so much blood. And so, so he came back and he had a word for David. He said this, remember, I took you from sheepfold, from sheep clothing. And now you're in the king's palace. I think that put a new perspective in David's mind and his heart. We, our appreciation. Whoever sins much, loves much. You, you, you find out sometimes the worst sinners are the best Christians. You guys, nobody's a nod and they're like, I never know that. No, I don't know that. It's true. Because you've been so forgiven. You're so thankful for the cross. You're so thankful for what God has done. How your sins and your iniquities, he remembers no more. He gives you a brand new start. It's like, man, this is so awesome. I love you, Lord. Amen. You know, he just feels good. I don't have to go to bed with guilt and shame and sin and all that. Wow. Because God loves us. God loves us. Hallelujah. And he wants us to remember, though, sometimes, to go back and remember. And then, let me see, what time we got? All right, I'm pushing the limit right now, so I'm going to move to the, the very last slide. This is from the message version of Thessalonians, which is really good news for all of us. It says this, may God himself, somebody say God himself. Hallelujah. The God who makes everything holy and what? Whole. We're talking about wholeness. The God who makes everything holy and whole. Make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of the Master, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
and the, the Message Bible didn't separate it, but this is another verse that says, and the one who called you is completely dependable, and he said it, guess what? He's going to do it. It's just a matter of yielding our lives, surrendering our lives to him. Paul said this in Romans 12, 1. And the reason why he said it, he's speaking to Gentiles that did not have the promises, but he talks about in chapter 11 how we were engrafted in and we get all the promises, the inheritance of God, we get the holders, we get all the, the whole package. He says, now I'm going to beg you, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Our reasonable act of worship. God's not asking for much. He's just saying, I want your heart. I get your heart, I'll get everything else. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'd just like, I'd like to just give an opportunity right now for people online or even people here in this place. If you have not given your life to the Lord and you, want, and you have not gone to the cross and had your sins forgiven and let Christ come in so he can make you whole in body, soul, and spirit, and you have not done that, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, I want to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And if you, if you say, I just want to, I want to appreciate the cross more and I want to know more about God's forgiveness and mercy and love and rekindle the fire that was once in me, I'd like for you to raise your hand there. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Father. We thank you, God, that without the cross, we'd all be lost without hope and without God. That's so important, Father, for us to know that your mercy is there, your grace is there, and with thy loving kindness you have drawn us, Lord. And I just pray, God, for your mercy and your grace to be upon our church, upon our community, and that you would bring people to your cross and find that hope and that eternal life. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name.